You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Welcome to the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast, episode number 94. No one has a job in our business until you type the end. James V. Hart. Broadcasting from a dark, windowless room in Hollywood, when we really should be working on that next draft. It's the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast, showing you the craft and business of screenwriting while teaching you how to make your screenplay bulletproof. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Now, today's show is sponsored by Bulletproof Script Coverage. Now, unlike other script coverage services, Bulletproof Script Coverage actually focuses on the kind of project you are and the goals of the project you are. So we actually break it down by three categories, micro-budget, indie film market, and studio film. There's no reason to get coverage from a reader that's used to reading tentpole movies when your movie is going to be done for $100,000. And we wanted to focus on that at Bulletproof Script Coverage. Our readers have worked with Marvel Studios, CAA, WME, NBC, HBO, Disney, Scott Free, Warner Brothers, The Blacklist, and many, many more. So if you need your screenplay or TV script covered by professional readers, head on over to CoverMyScreenplay.com. Now, before we get started, guys, I wanted to let you know that, as promised, I am launching a huge Black Friday, Cyber Monday sale for the rest of November. It will end on November 30th. You're getting up to 70% off all the courses on IFH Academy, including our formatting and story development courses. And if you're into distribution, film producing, if you want to produce your own scripts, uh, how to network, how to build a career in the film business, we got a bunch of new webinars and online courses to help you on your path. So if you want to take advantage of that, head over to bulletproofscreenwriting.tv forward slash Black Friday. Now, guys, today on the show, you are in for a treat. We have an epic episode today because I have the legendary screenwriter, James V. Hart. Now, if you're not familiar with James's work, let me just lay out a couple of his credits. Films like Hook, directed by Steven Spielberg, Bram Stoker's Dracula, directed by Francis Ford Coppola, Contact, directed by Robert Zemeckis, as well as Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, Tuck Everlasting, Sahara, Laura Croft, Tomb Raider, August Rush, and of course, Muppet Treasure Island as well. He has done so much in the business and has worked with some of the most legendary film directors of all time. And I was so, 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 so excited to have James on the show because one thing I've never actually said on the show was that Bram Stoker's Dracula is one of the major influences in my filmmaking career and is one of the reasons why I wanted to become a filmmaker. And James brought that film to life with the legendary Francis Ford Coppola. And we go into deep stories about how uh, that movie (laughs) fell off the rails a bunch of times and what he developed to not only save that film, but to help other screenwriters help them with their emotional pulse of their screenplays. We also talk about Hook and how he came up with that idea with his six-year-old son and how Spielberg got involved and Robin Williams and Dustin Hoffman. And we go into his amazing story mapping tool, The Heart Chart, which is a system that he created working with Francis Ford Coppola on Dracula to kind of track the emotion of your screenplay. Now, as you guys know, I've talked to a lot of people on this show with a ton of different story systems and techniques and methods to get to the story. But what James is presenting in this episode and what he's presented with the heart chart is really revolutionary. And it it really does make you look at your story completely differently. It is Pretty remarkable what he's done, and I cannot wait to share this episode with you. So without any further ado, please enjoy my conversation with James V. Hart. I'd like to welcome to the show James V. Hart. How are you doing, James? So far, so good. 
Thank you so much for, for coming on the show. I am, as we were talking a little bit before we started recording, I am a huge fan of, uh, many, many of the movies you've done. You, you kind of were there at the beginning of my journey as a filmmaker with, uh. with, uh, Hook and Dracula specifically. And we'll, we'll get into all of those as well. But, um, I mean, you've, you've done a lot, sir, in your, in your, your, your tenure in Hollywood. <laughs> well, I did have a little help, you know. <laughs> Along pretty, pretty substantial help. Yes, exactly. And it's and, and of course everyone always looks at you know your careers like yours, like, oh God, you know, he just started off with Spielberg. I'm like, no, he's he was hustling a little bit prior to Hook. <laughs> I was forty four years old and I was the overnight sensation that had been standing in the corner for twenty years. Exactly. Yeah. So let so let's get into that. How did you get started in the business? Uh, well I grew up in the in the sixties. Um went to film school at a nondescript film school in Texas. And I had always, my dad was a big drive in movie guy. So he was always throwing us in the car and popping popcorn and going to the movies. And, um, and we had a place in Fort Worth called the gateway theater. So on Saturdays, my mom would dump us there. Um, 25 cents. We got two features, five cereals, a hundred cartoons. And we spent the whole day at the movies. Um, and then we'd go home and reenact the films. So I didn't know you could, I didn't know how do you, how to get in the movie business. Uh, and then, in, then we started going as teenagers on Friday night, which got really interesting, but, uh, I became, um, obsessed with films and, uh, from a very early stage and my parents to their credit never, um, talked me out of it <laughs> and we didn't know. So I mean, I went to SMU, which had no, uh, very little known film school, but a gentleman named G. William Jones, um, our, the head of our department, uh, brought in some of the hit relationships all over hit all over the, the, the country. Um, I mean, George Roy Hill came to you in 1969 with a wet gate answer print, but you don't know what that is. A wet gate answer print. I actually, a wet do. Gate answer print. I actually, okay. I, I actually shot film back in the day. So I, okay. I'm, I'm aware. I am aware. A wet gate answer print of Butch and Sundance. Wow. Nobody had seen it. There were just 30 of us. We spent five hours with George Roy Hill after watching the movie discussing. Alan Pakula brought uh, Joe Cuckoo. Um, Dennis Hopper and, and, and Jack showed up with Easy Rider. And I watched, you know, every co-ed in the room sign Jack Nicholson's arm with their phone number. So we didn't have, you know, we couldn't text in those days. Right, right. So I had, and so, and we didn't know. I mean, we weren't, we weren't UCLA. We weren't, you know, um, NYU or any of, the, any of the big film schools, but we had this amazing um, access. I mean, Robert Altman brought MASH the screen. Oh my God. At, S- at SMU, and it saved the film. They were going to dump it because uh, it was, they were doing Torah, 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 or some big. They were just let his. And the reaction in Texas at, the, at, the, at our film festival changed the course of that film. Wow. You know? So I, I, was, I didn't know how blessed we I thought everybody, you know. I had had Robert that. Altman and Jack Nicholson and, yeah. and Dennis Hopper walking and you show. hang out with them and stuff, you know, and and so um, and we made films, we made narrative, you know, thirty minute color films in at SMU in this nondescript film school, um, and decided uh, that you know I didn't go to Vietnam, I got lucky, um, and I just told my mom and dad I wanted to be in the movie business. They said okay, <laughs> and this was the time, and this was the time when. The movie business that wasn't even a considered a career. Like that's not well, a thing. <laughs> to, to, to the sixties and seventies were exploding in the, indie, in the indie film world. And actually, right. I, have to, I have to point to Ellen Kit Carson, who came to. I don't know you, uh, Kit was one of the leaders of the indie film movement. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, David Holzman's Diary sort of set the standard. Of the Jim McBride film changed everything. Um, Kit was a journalist and also wrote. Um, uh, criticism and everything. He was, he was a, an amazing person. He got Wes Anderson started or, or was part of nobody starts Wes Anderson. But son, he was part of that. So he came and lectured at our class that we only had 15 students in our film class. There were 30 in the department. <laughs> right. Know, we were to wind up Bolexes, you know? Mm-hmm. Oh, I remember. Um, and uh, Kit came to Show us David Holzman's diary, which if you haven't seen, is, is an incredible first kind of mockumentary or first kind of documentary that wasn't really a documentary. Um, and I asked a few questions during the session. And afterwards, he said, come on, let's go have coffee. 
And he took me to um, the, on the campus there, and we went to the student center and had coffee. And he basically was saying, this is what you're going to do. You're going to write. And in those days, it, you, know, you didn't think about being a writer. You thought about being a director, mm-hmm. the director of Superstar, you know. And, um, and the kid was right. He sort of outed me um, and got me thinking about the possibility. And especially if Coppola had started in Zoetrope. Mm-hmm. There was independent film. And Den- Den- Dennis changed the world with Easy Rider. Um, uh, uh, five easy pieces. Uh, Bob Rapelson. I mean, the, I mean the the, the Monty Hellman. You know, were these groundbreaking directors that were doing stuff their way. So my friend and I got in our van. Uh, we sent our movie to Francis Coppola, American Zoetrope, uh, and we drove to California in our van. And we went to Los Angeles and knocked on 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 uh, the door there at uh, at. Uh, uh, TBC at uh, the at Rapelson's production company um, uh, met with him, and then we drove up to San Francisco and sat in San Francis Coppola's office reception room for a week. What? Really? Every day we were, and we're the guys from Texas. We came here to see Mr. Coppola. We sent him our film, you know. And the Dragon Lady, of course, said, "Well, you know, he's really busy." And this was a great. This was the very beginning of Zoetrope. This was like this was. I mean. Uh, uh, had, T- had THX people, been released people, yet? Had THX been released yet or not yet? Just, 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 just released. He was doing Rain People, right? Yeah. Um, and um, so uh, George Lucas would come in and out. You know, there was an uh, um, uh, oh god, who did the thing, the director who did um, right stuff? Um, Which one? Oh, uh, uh, yeah, I know who you're talking about. Yeah, I forgot his name. San Francisco directors. That whole crew was in a um, uh, brilliant. Um, uh, brilliant cinematographers, Cable Deschanel, Caleb Deschanel, you know, in and out. And we sat there all week going, we're back. You know, and she, well, you know, he's really busy. I've told him you're here, you know. And finally on Friday, we, we didn't get the hint, you know. It was like, finally she said, you know, he's leaving for the weekend. And he's really not going to be able to see you. And we said, well, we'll come back Monday. And she said, well, he's going to be gone for a very long time. So about this time, I see through the little glass hallway portal window, you know, here comes Coppola. And he had the Jerry Garcia hair in those days. Yeah, yeah. And he opens the door and walks into the reception room. We get it. Mr. Coppola, Mr. Coppola, we're the guys from Texas. And I know the dragon lady's behind us going, you know, and Francis doesn't say a word. He just wheels, pivots and heads right back through the door and waves at us over his shoulder and says, keep making movies. And, uh, Stephen and I went, wow. Francis Coppola just told us to keep making movies. Wow. Not knowing, of course, we were being completely blown off. And Francis did get Stephen, my my partner then uh, in filmmaking, uh, a job on a Roger Corman film that was shooting in Texas. So he he did come through. But years later, when we were doing Dracula, I told him the story. Um, uh, and he said, do you know how many guys like you showed up in my office? I have no idea. I can't remember a thing about this. You know, like, Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Coppola. Thank you. But Thank that you so gave much. Us, that gave us the bug. We went back to Texas and said, Francis Coppola said for us to keep making movies. Which wasn't so, a lie. Which wasn't a lie. Which wasn't a yeah. lie. Yeah. So we raised money in Texas and shot a film in Europe um, that Leon Capitanis directed, who uh, um, um, if you Google him, you'll find out who he worked with, uh, great directors and co- comedic uh, directors. Um, got in a lot of festivals. Mm-hmm. Um Kim brought it out to L.A. to sell it. Um, it was in, it was when Dirty Harry was in popular. We were doing a, a European style movie about two hitchhikers from North Carolina hitchhiking around Europe during the summer, and what was happening. So we're more like Truffaut. Mm-hmm. We didn't have any killings or car chases, or <laughs> right. but it got it, it. It got us. It won a lot of awards at festivals, and even Peter Goober saw it. And said, "I hope my first movie is this good." So we kept being encouraged. We kept being killed with kindness. You know, and um, uh, and I didn't start writing until I I, you know, I, wrote, I wrote in high school, but I never didn't know it was a job. Um, and uh, we were raising money for another couple of other bad Texas films uh, that were nightmares. And the scripts kept coming in, and I kept going, I don't, this is not good. So um, my friend Bill Kirby, William Chamberlain Kirby, uh, the name of the 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 rose. Uh, um, that, that he wrote, he did Halle, he wrote Halle, he wrote Stunt Man, a bunch of stuff. He was my mentor. Um, wow. And uh, we started writing together. Um, 
and wrote several scripts that never got made, but they, they gave us a, a profile. And the first script I wrote by myself, I put my I put another name on it. I was embarrassed that anybody would think that I was I was about it was called Frat Rats. It was basically Animal House before Animal House and became a big lawsuit. Um, but I put a name of a person on it I hated in college. So, you know, they're sort of my disguise. And then people would give me criticism not knowing it was me, which was a huge help. And yeah. it also it also taught me to be tortured, developing a thick skin. You know, <laughs> okay. And not react. But I started writing and um, uh, got some, got a couple of blessings. Um, um, got hired to write my male cheerleader story, my Texas experience, which is a terrible film. But gave me a chance to get produced and, um, and find out what it was like to get paid to write because that's when it changes. So, you know, so when they pay to write. They, they, that's when it changes. Yo, know, absolutely. Then it becomes serious. Like, oh my god, this is real. Yeah, I remember yeah. when I got paid to direct. I was like, oh my god, this is this is a thing. I can actually yeah. do this. I'm not just do. I'm not actually paying for the privilege of doing that. Someone actually has paid me to, yeah. to, to yeah. do it. So, okay. So, from your male cheerleader Texas movie, which I'm assuming that was give the one me, that give, give me an F. Yeah, give me. That's what I thought it was. Give me an F. I'm assuming that's give me an F. Um, from oh god, what was the the covers like? Something from Beaver View uh, or, you, or yeah, the Beaver Camp Beaver it was Camp terrible. Beaver View uh, or something like that. It's like oh wow, I saw that. I was like, yeah, but well, hey, you know, hey, we listen. All, when I wrote it, I wrote Mash for Girls. Yeah, <laughs> the producers got a hold of it and went, we can't do that. We can't make this movie. We have to do tits and ass and you know and all that. Yeah, of course. And of so course. I watched I watched the movie and I just go. Oh, God. That was my last con. That was my last comedy. Yeah, you know? exactly. Uh, so, what I wrote was really savage, and 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 the way the girls talked and the way they thought. And, so more, it would be more kind of like um like Fast Times and Ridgemont High because that was yeah. actually that was a more it was funny, but it was actually really raw and really yeah. authentic. Uh, but the producers Our slap shot, slap shot, the yeah. language and slap shot. That's when I saw that I went, hey, there it is. Yeah, yeah. So all right, so you go from. Um, from your male cheerleader movie, how do you go from there to working on Hook? Yeah, with right. Spielberg, with Spielberg, good, good because there's a, there's a big jump there. There's a because in the IMDb, in the in your IMDb, there's a big gap from 1984 to 1991, and there's a I'm sure some stuff happened there, but I'm really curious on you know it doesn't have to be the whole story, but just how did you get into the office and how did you get that gig? Because I'm assuming in 91. This is pre Jurassic Park, so I know during that time because my time my time frame I was worked in a video store from eighty seven eighty eight to about ninety three. So during you were that Kevin Smith, yeah, Ken Tarantino, Kevin Smith, all that. Yeah, I was that time period. So in that time period, I'm pretty much excellent in trivia. Like I know all the movies that got released during that time, and you and you made a bunch of them in that time. And I know from, from my recollection, Spielberg had already – Steven had already had a couple of – he was always Steven, and he was always a, a hit. Yeah. But a lot of people were saying, oh, it's over for Steven. You know, it's great. He hasn't really had a big hit in a while. This is pre-Schindler's List and pre-Jurassic Park. And but but Hook was a big deal when it was being produced. It was like everybody huge. wanted to be on the set. It was huge. How did you get that gig? <laughs> well, it, it wasn't a gig. I created it. My son, my son, at age six, at, at the dinner table, he's now my writing partner. Said, "What if Peter Pan grew up?" It was a game we played. The okay. What if game? I was a very successful development deal writer who wasn't getting anything made, but you making know, a living. But making a living. Walk in and get a development deal. Right. You know, uh, made a living, put kids through private school, and and my son would come home and say, "Dad, everybody wants to know what movies you've made." And I couldn't point to give me an F. So I went and said, I showed him the wall of scripts. I'd written, I had written for Spielberg. I'd written for Frank Marshall. I'd written for Robert Redford and, and Paul Newman to reunite. I mean, I had some very prestigious gigs. None of them got made. So when it came time for, uh, I decided I, uh, that there were two films that I had to make, Dracula and Hook. And uh, I was actually fired by CAA and let go because I hadn't had anything made. And I was in my 40s. While I was writing Hook and Dracula. <laughs> yeah. Dracula, Dracula was set up as a USA movie for television with a budget of two and a half million dollars. Okay. And dear sweet Karen Moore, who we're still friends today, paid me to write that script. Um, at the same time, um, uh, I was working with uh, Craig, uh, Craig Baumgarten and, and 
Adelson, uh, Greg Adelson, Greg Adelson, uh, on um, a development deal at Sony, and they came to me and said, "What do you have that nobody wants to do?" I had tried; I had pitched Hook all, Hook all over town. When my son gave me the idea, mm-hmm. and my daughter now was part of that, she just directed her fourth film. When we came up with Hook, it was blasphemy. You know, uh, right. you were treading on sacred ground. You couldn't have a, couldn't have a grown up Peter Pan. Uh, Stephen was trying to do Peter Pan, but Michael Jackson. Uh, Coppola had tried to do Peter Pan. Uh, uh, Jose, from, uh, there's a bunch of people had wanted, but every, uh, John Hughes wanted to do Peter Pan. They all kept coming up with the same idea: the darlings go back to Neverland, or the darlings' children go back to Neverland. So it was always the same story. And it wasn't until Jake said, and then during our "What If" game, you know, Dad did Peter Pan grow up, and I said, "Of course he didn't." You know, that's a stupid question. Being the good parent that I was, and uh, Jake said, "Yeah, but what if Peter Pan grew up?" And boom, the bells and whistles went off. We pitched it all over town. Everybody passed on it. Finally, Craig Baumgarten said, what do you have that nobody wants to do? And I gave him my 10 pages on Hook. Brought in Nick Castle, who I adored his film, uh, The Boy You Could Fly. Um, uh, and we, we made a, a low-ball development deal with Jeff Sagansky at, at uh, TriStar, at Sony TriStar, it, as a favor. Nobody gave a shit about the, what we were doing. So Nick and I went off for a year and smoked cigars and, and drank single malt and, and, and took, the, took the idea of the story from, you know, what was the worst thing I could do to Peter Pan to grow up making me a lawyer, you know. Um, so we spent a year on the script just having a ball. Um, so Gansky leaves Sony and, Bob, and um, Mike Metavoy comes in. And usually, whenever you know, you know the drill. The studio head changes, and everything. Oh, is the, shut, the, yeah, shut it's all window. it's tainted. It's tainted. It's yeah, it's tainted. It didn't work for you. Mike Metaboy reads the script and goes, "Wait a minute, this is huge." And I don't know this is going on. I mean, I'm trying to pay the light bill, <laughs> you know. And um, so uh, Metaboy got together with CAA, and they went out to five directors over one weekend. Um. And I still don't know who all was on that list, but I know most of them. And Stephen was the one who said yes. And my wife always knew that if Stephen found out about Hook, that he would do it. Because it, 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 lay, it, was a, it, was a, it, it hit all of us right in our guts. This was, we were all fathers. We were, you know, Dustin was older. He had kids. Robin was, was turning 40. He had kids. I and mean, Stephen was having a new family. You know, everybody suddenly had that father thing going on Mm -hmm. and that responsibility of of what happens when you grow up and and you've forgotten your childhood so uh, we were actually in um wyoming um staying with friends we'd rented we rented out both of our apartments (laughs) we had the kids you know uh, and i was trying to hope that my credit card worked to pay the lunch bill at uh, cadillac jacks and in those days we didn't have cell phones I had to go downstairs to the payphone, hope my credit card worked, and check my answering machine. Remember answering <laughs> machines? I do, sir. <laughs> um, hi. Um, and there was an answering machine from John. Uh, the message from John Levin, who's been my was my agent at CAA and still is in, in my representative for like thirty five, almost forty years. He said, "Call me." There's a very big director that that wants to do Hook. So I called him. And we spoke, and I said, if it's not Spielberg, we're not having a conversation. And he went, that's who it is. <laughs> so I went back upstairs to my kids and to Judy, and who were all sitting there, you know, trying to figure out where we're going to go next, and gave them the news. Uh, and it was, you know, it was, um, it was a tremendous. Um, it was like, you know, it's one of those Hollywood stories. You know, you just, it, it happened. And um, um, so it, I, and I had written the script long before Spielberg was involved. Right. It's still an issue, you know, uh, that, that, that so much creativity. I mean, I created Rufio. Mm-hmm. You know, I created that whole multiracial lost boy thing. We, we, we had Wendy grow up. We had be old. You know, we did all the stuff. We'd, actually, there's a lot more Barry in the script than, that, than there is in, in, in the, the Disney version. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it suddenly the, 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 everything changed. Oh, of you know, course. And, uh, and uh, Nick, you know, Nick, it was difficult to watch Nick be replaced because we both worked so hard on this. That's why I insisted he get story credit. But within the same period of time, I turned in Dracula six weeks later. Now, this is an agency that fired me 
And you and were they representing you at this point? I asked them to please stay. I said, I'm writing these two scripts. Well, nobody's going to do those. Just represent me until I get to that point where I'm done. Then you can cut me loose. And my lawyers tried all over town to give me. Nobody even wanted to represent me. You know, uh, while I was writing these scripts, right. uh, Dracula had been done a hundred times. Nobody was going to do Dracula. Nobody wanted to do grown up Peter Pan. And to John Levin's credit, John Levin took Hook to Dustin and Robin. And they went to Stephen. Oh, that's how and it went. John so it was, it was through the actors yeah, and they went. Uh, exactly. Smart. Exactly. And John Levin went to uh, Winona Ryder um, and nobody could believe she wanted to do Dracula. And she's the one who called Francis and said, will you read this script for me? Because I need to know if I'm, I'm, I want to play a grown up, you know, right. plus she stuck it to him on Godfather three by walking out the door and, and we got to meet Sophia. Yes, I remember. Uh, of course. So, um, so in a, in a matter of two months, I went from the abyss to the two biggest directors in 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 my world, wanting to do two scripts that nobody wanted to do. Um, it does. Everybody, everybody passed on. So, uh, uh, I didn't handle it very well. I was, you know, all these agents suddenly call you back and go, "Hey, we were just kidding," you know. Uh, we. <laughs> Uh, all right, right, I didn't make the decision, but somebody else's decision. And I'm just going, you're on the same writer I was when you We're gonna didn't me. want to represent me. So I'll, I'll stick with John Levitt. You know? Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, and uh, and that's that's how I got the gig. Uh, and um, uh, I watched uh, I watched two of the greatest directors in the world struggle. I had such admiration for, for what they had to go through to get those movies made. Because yeah. Spielberg, was, uh, yeah, because Hook was Hook was a challenging film to make. It's a, 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 yeah. and technically and creatively, and I mean the, those sets. I remember hearing stories of everybody in Hollywood had to make a trip to the set because the sets the were set, so amazing, yeah. and uh, it was a tough sell too. I, I personally loved Hook, and I thought it was amazing, and I it, and it gives me warm feelings inside every time I watch it. Uh, and now more th- more than ever because now I'm that 40 something with kids Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. I loved it when I was 20 something, but now it completely has a completely different connotation now. Like, Oh wow. Shoot. It's a completely thing. Now now you're, now your kids see it. And now my kids see it and and all that kind of stuff. But then with Dracula, Dracula was that first film. I remember seeing Dracula in the theater opening and it was a huge opening. I remember it was because that saved saved Francis's life and say, and set records. Nobody could believe how big it was. It was. And it was, if I remember correctly, one of the best trailers I'd ever seen. Sid Gannis, Sid Gannis. Oh my God. What what a trailer editor. I mean, cause that trailer sold the movie so beautifully. Yeah. And the way, and then in the way Francis went about it with this old kind of like turn of the century style filmmaking and using older technologies and reversing the film, and it was just so rich and the transitions and how he was able to do it. But you were telling me a story before we we, we started recording um, that Francis uh, made a phone call to you. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, Dra- when Dracula sets were being built, when Hook was coming down, so it's kind of a heady time for me. But we'd had we'd had we were deep in post production and had a release date right around Halloween in 1992, um, and Francis had been in the editing room nonstop, and we'd had two or three disastrous previews. I mean, just disastrous. And um, I watched this courageous man go, "Oh well, it's another rewrite. Let's go back." You know, and just the studio is panicking and they're want to shut it down and come and take over and what have you. So um, it was about mid late summer. We're opening in October. Mid the summer, I get a phone call at midnight uh, uh, in New York from Francis. Uh, and when you know Mr. Coppola calls, you you don't you wake up, um, and he said, "Ah, well, okay, uh, Jim, I want you to get on a plane in the morning and come out here as fast as you can." He said, uh, um, "I hate the film. I hate the script. I hate you. I hate the fact that you ever wrote it. I hate the actors. I hate the studio. I hate the whole idea that I ever got involved in this piece of shit." I want to show you that movie. Wow. So great, great sales pitch. Yay. <laughs> I can't wait. Um, so the next night I'm there and I'm in San Francisco and I don't, I don't, to Judy, I don't know how long I'm gone. I don't know what's happening. I don't know if this is a day trip, if I'm being fired, if the movies, you know, I don't know what's happening. 
So the next evening, I'm down in the Godfather screening room there at Zoetrope, as, as Francis called the Bohemian Amblin. You know, the big, <laughs> big Godfather couches and, and cigars and wine and liquor and two women that spoke Romanian. I don't know why they were there, but there were these two women. I think they were, you know, bite my throat or something. Right. Uh, and Francis didn't even come down. He called me from the penthouse. Okay, good. You're here. You're fine. You know, okay. All right. So I want you to call me after you screen the movie and I'll come down and we'll talk. This is about 10 o'clock at night. So by 1030, I'm drunk. Um, by the time the film is over, I'm, can, I, I'm so angry. I'm so pissed. I mean, uh, he, he was right. He was a piece of shit. Wow. You know, and I had been to all the dailies. The, we rehearsed. We did, did this incredible prep that he uh, learned yeah. from him. Uh, prep, all the prep he did. All I the saw. Yeah. All, you know, uh, uh, the storyboards that we did, the screenplay was lauded by the actors. You know, there, there wasn't a bunch of people saying, this sucks, throw it out. They wanted to add more. Um, and I'm going, how did this happen? So then Francis comes down uh, in his dapper, you know, we're smoking robe and a cravat and stuff, little pointed Turkish shoes and, you know, and all happy and said, you didn't call me. I said, yeah, I, I, I hate you too. <laughs> I, I hate it too. So he said, let me tell you, the, let me, like a big kid, let me tell you the film I wanted, we're going to make. And I'm going, didn't we just make this movie? You know? And he pitched me what I thought we'd shot. But what I began to recognize um, is that during the shooting, we had we, we sat in the next two weeks and went through every footage, all the footage we had, and went through the existing cut. And we began to identify pieces of narrative that the film needed. Not whole scenes to be reshot, but pieces, transitions, piece of narration, an insert here, you know. Um, and I kept saying to friends, there's got to be a way to head this off at the pass so you don't want to get the editing room. You fix some of this in the script. There's got to be a way to measure that script and, 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 and uh, manage that script so it's telling you a whole lot more than because we had we we were thought we were golden. I had the greatest director in the world, and here we are in the interview room, panicked. You know, and wow. I said especially because indie filmmakers don't have the money to bring back you know Winona Ryder and and Gary, Gary you know, and Ke and Keanu and, 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 and everything. You know, they don't have that kind of money. They they're in the editing room going, we're fucked. Right. So this is where the heart chart came from. Uh, I'll just give you an example of the. We didn't shoot any new scenes. We shot pieces. We realized that we had never seen Dracula and Mina together, I mean, uh, his wife together, before he went to battle. So when she hands him the helmet, you know, and he goes off to battle, um, um, the ending was the big controversy because the ending didn't work. The ending, uh, she stabs him and 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 uh, plunges the knife into him, and she's redeemed, and he dies at peace, and he's redeemed. And then she walks out the door and walks into the arms of Keanu Reeves. And the audience was like booing. No. And I kept saying to Francis, that's not who they want to see. They want to see when they want to see Winona and Gary stay together somehow. Forever. <laughs> yeah, forever. So he had George Lucas and Mike um, Minghella, uh, no, uh, yeah, uh, Hellboy, watch the film to see. Yeah, and we'd done a cut. We'd done, we spruced it up and we told them where we were going to fill in these blanks and that sort of thing. We got to the ending, and George said, you broke your rules. You, you, you don't have the right ending. Uh, she has to cut off his head, which is the rules you set up in the film to totally redeem him. She's got to complete the mission. And then not walk out the door in the kind of reason's arm. So I remember Francis calling me, and he said, uh, okay, George saw the film, and um, he thinks that you know we got to do this. And he, said, and, and he said, do you think we can um, – you think Winona would – you know, come back and work with Gary if she cut off his head. And I said, I think that's the only way you'll get, you'll get her back. Because if, if, if yeah, I don't mean, had, I don't mean to stop. Legendary, not getting along, you know. The, yeah, they had a rough, a rough time on that yeah. set from what I heard. Legendary. Yeah. So we came back and, and put that chapel scene back up together. He had built all those sets like theater sets so he could just fold them out. You wow. know, it's incredible. Wow. Um, save the gargoyles. So the, in that last scene where you see the, all, of, all of that seamless work, some of the close-ups and some of the wide shots are shot a year apart. And wow. you're seamless. 
But they had to do wigs. They had to do all this stuff, you know. And she cuts off his head. And then Roman came up with the idea of the beautiful um, uh, mosaic and the ceiling of them mm-hmm. together, you know, flying together. Um, but I kept saying there has to be a way to, in the screenplay form, while you're doing the script to measure these emotional journeys your characters are going on and how to head some of this off of the path. We should have caught the fact that she had to cut off his head. You know, if we'd followed the emotional journey of, of what Carrie always had to do to Sadie by cutting off her head and taking out her heart. You know, if we'd, if I'd, if I'd have been measuring that emotional journey instead of just it'd been a great scene, you know? So, uh, he said, well, why don't you start with these three questions? And he gave me three journalist questions, which was the beginning of the heart chart. And the questions were very simple. Uh, and I, re- and I figured, and if I, he said, just answer those three questions <clears throat> before you start anything again, before you start the story. And so I started using the questions and then I expanded them to 10 questions and I started drawing these charts, these actual hand drawing charts to measure the heartbeat and the emotional journey of the characters, not an outline, not cards on the wall. Cause like even cards on the wall, I get lost. Mm-hmm. Where am I emotionally? Where am I pace wise? Where, how important is this? So the chart, the chart was uh, like your, your EKG when you get your heart. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, those of you who are old enough to do that. And uh, I, I saw, so we started out by drawing them. That's the Austin Film Festival, one of the very early charts. Yeah, yeah, I see it, I see it. And then in 2015, a guy, Goldstein, came to me who did Writer's Duet, and he said, I can do an app. So now we are an online app. Right. That is, that is the Dracula chart, the very first chart I ever did. Okay. And there, there's the drawn one. So, and I started doing it at the Austin Film Festival every year but doing my films. And then people said, well, though you wrote those films, you, you know, you're, you, you, you know, you did that on purpose. And I went, ah, so we started take doing other people's films. So I've done, um, Jordan Peele, get out. I've done, um, um, Jamie, this is Eels, uh, La La Land, um, uh, Bo Burnham, eighth grade, uh, the, the wedding crashers, uh, mm-hmm. you know, uh, Batman. I mean, suddenly you start applying these principles to it and, if you just follow this, you'll never face a blank page. You'll never be, you'll never be writer's block. It does. I don't believe in writer's block. Mm-hmm. My, my daughter just said it yesterday on her podcast. She doesn't believe in writer's block either. That there are ways, if you know craft, you're always jumpstarting. You're always writing and answering questions and solving problems. So uh, the heart chart is, this is my booklet. Mm-hmm. It used to just be printed up and given away. That's how thick it is. <laughs> how how thick is Robert McKee's book? A bit thicker. And and how much dust is it collecting on your shelf? A lot. Yeah. <laughs> Chris, Chris Vogler has, has the only book that's as thick as McKee that's, that should be used. Now, listen, McKee did a great – did a lot for the screenwriting trade. Sure. You know. This is all you need. And it says right there, never face a blank page again. There's some shitty ones, you know. But you won't be blank. So this, they finally begged me to put this together at Austin, and we just started it about three or four years ago, and it's caught on. And the app, the chart you saw, is now available online. And it's an opt-in, opt-out. It's a monthly subscription, and you can, it saves everything in the cloud, every version you make, every every change you make. Um, and um, uh, if you go to the website, you can see the examples, and you can see it come to life. I needed it because it showed me an emotional journey. What was pulling my characters through the narrative instead of being pushed, and that's what I'd been doing all the, up until Dracula. You'd been pushing. I pushed everything, and even even Hook. I learned a lot on Hook of finding character. If you do this, you will be writing character-driven narratives as opposed to plot-driven, uh, and uh, it's even now being used in some, by some showrunners and TV to where they can take the chart and do a whole season. You know, it really lets you see on one page the emotional journey your characters can go through instead of an outline. You know, now there's a lot of work you do before that. I mean, there's a lot of writing you do before you put it on the chart. But those three questions that Francis gave me is where, where this all started. I went, oh, my God. And there's, and people go, oh, that's easy. You know, what does my character want? What do they need? What are they afraid of? What, you know, what, 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 what is their visible, tangible goal? What is, you know, is it a satisfying ending? Because the biggest one for me is do you have a satisfying ending? Not happy, not sad, not good or bad, but have you satisfied your audience with the journey you've taken them on? 
And I know everybody's got plenty of movies and TV series where they didn't like the ending of the series, or didn't like the end of the season, or they didn't like the end of the, you know, um, uh, like Lost. Or, yeah, um, so Lost um, is a bad... Or, uh, you know... Well, a good, a good example of a movie that a show that did had a had a horrible ending that people hated was Lost. But another a great one I feel is Breaking Bad. Like Breaking, exactly. Breaking exactly. Bad's ending was totally perfect and satisfying, yeah, totally and satisfying. like Vince did a perfect job. And that was a yeah. heavy, that was a lot of weight yeah. to carry because he was so good. Almost every episode of that series was amazing, and it just kind of kept growing yeah. and yeah. growing. Yeah. And if he if he missed the landing, the whole thing comes crashing. Oh, okay. Right, Sopranos. Ever been, the, the, the last episode of the Sopranos, you know, mm-hmm. you, people like are the last even the last episode of Game of Thrones, like oh, yeah. people pulling their hair out. So yeah. these are all things that I think you can. Uh, I, Vogler and I both agree on this. There are certain storytelling principles in the ether of the universe you can't fuck with. Yeah, you can try, and they're going to get you. Right, or you can learn to manage them and, and use them to your benefit. Like structure for me is an, is not a formula. Structure for me is lightning in the bottle. It actually liberates you if you know structure. Uh, so my whole thing is about structure and about character driven narratives, um, and um, it's the only way I've survived. Uh, it, you know, it's not one of those things where I'm a working writer. I do use this every single day in my in my craft. I'm adapting a book right now for Scott Winant. That's how I adapt. I actually do mm-hmm. notes. Well, and every and I'm using this. I use these principles, these questions, these signposts in every single thing I do. And you'll see some quotes from from some pretty big writers that 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 have didn't want to know about it until they saw what I did with the chart. And they went, "Oh my God, you know more about the movie than I do." You know, and I directed or I wrote it. So so um, and it's it's great for threshold writers. It's a lot of writers that are struggling to try to figure out how you know, how do I get to be that. Mm-hmm. They, I've seen them stop in the middle of my sessions and go and solve a problem and come back and say, I just solved it. You know, I know what I'm missing. Well, and it's, I want it to be mechanical, not some, you know, spiritual guided talent that you, you can only have if you're special, you right. know, that it really, that there really is a mechanical process to what we do as writers. The one thing, the one thing I, 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 and I just, I literally just had Chris on a couple of weeks ago uh, again yeah. because it was 25th anniversary of Writer's yeah. Journey. Yeah, yeah. And I was on, and, I was on the tribute. Yeah, yeah, and he, and he's, I mean, I love Chris to death. And the one thing I was talking to him about in regards to plot and character, plot and character, because that, that's always a lot of people are like, oh, I'm plot first only. It's all oh, I'm only character based, or I'm, or I, you know, theme and all the, and people just try to pigeonhole themselves. But the one thing I, I, for, I think it was him, or I think it was uh, another guest that I spoke to, but this concept of all the great movies, what do you remember? Do you remember the plot, or do you remember the character? Like I vaguely remember. I know. I, I mean, I've seen all the Indiana Joneses. I remember Indiana Jones. I, and I do remember some parts of Raiders of the Lost Ark's plot, like quote unquote plot, but I remember Indiana Jones. So characters yeah. are what we, we don't identify with plot as a, as a species. We identify with other human beings, other characters. The characters yeah. And yeah. that's what you connect with. Like you connect with Andy Dufresne in Shawshank. You know, the plot yeah. is, the plot is fantastic. And, and, but it's all about his yeah. experience yeah. in that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Did you ever heart chart Shawshank? Yes, I did. Um, Frank, um, um, Frank and I go way back. We did Frankenstein together. That was the last film he didn't direct. Uh-huh. Um, um, Frank t- talks about Shawshank in a very interesting way because a, a, a lot of writers don't want to know about structure and don't want to know about. They want to be taught. They don't need. They don't have to learn anything. Mm-hmm. And Frank says, "We'll tell you that. Hey, I wrote Shawshank in five weeks, but he thought about it for eight years." <laughs> Yep. Yes. Yeah, so yep. when he sat down to write, he had figured all of this out in his head structurally, character wise, where he needed a scene and why. You know, he, I mean, so he did his chart in his head. Uh, Frank doesn't need my help. Um, there's a lot of writers who do need the, this help. It, it helps a lot of threshold writers get off the dime. And I have, I have writers from my Columbia classes that are now on directing and running companies and stuff, and they still teach the heart chart. You know, to their incoming to their incoming writers, um, Shawshank Shawshank is probably one of the top ten movies 
ever uh, on anybody's list. Yeah, oh, it's my number one. I mean, everyone in this in this. And uh, look at it. It's it's character, but it's also incredibly well structured. Oh, I mean, Gil Bell, when Gil Bellows gets shot, you know, oh. you had to be you had to structure that character up to that point where you could not afford to lose him, and that's mm-hmm. the point of no return. When he's dead, all bets are off. You know, right, different ball game. Right, because we're like you, he's going to get out. There's hope. Oh, he's got a hope. There's hope, and bang, pulls you right down the chart. You're up here, going, okay. He's got. There's news. He's got. He's going to out, and you. Know, <laughs> he's right. right down here. And then, of course, makes the villain even the the villain even that much more villainous, and like it yeah. completely just cements him as the absolute pure personification of evil. And by the way. That movie, that the end, and by the way, anyone who hasn't seen Shawshank, sorry, spoiler alerts on all this, but if he does that, and you want to talk about satisfying endings, yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean yeah. that is that is a satisfying ending. Yeah. Seeing him do what he did, the um, the uh, what's his name, uh, Clancy Clancy Brown's character, yeah. 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 get taken off, and then he's going to basically deal with whatever he was dishing out for the last twenty years himself now as a prisoner. Yeah. 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 And then just that beautiful ending, and from and the, and remi- please tell me if this is true or not. The original ending wasn't what Frank had in mind, from my understanding. The studio executive said, no, they need to see meet each other on the beach. And yeah. that was added after. Is that true? Yeah, that, that, yeah that's true. Yeah. Because that ending was – I, I do think – well, and, and that's, that's when the footage began. I, mean, I don't know where they, where they came up with that, where they came up with it in the, in, in the editing true. or at script stage. If my, my, my whole theory is you should be able to figure that out in the script stage. You're always going to learn something new from the footage. But if you track that emotional journey of those two characters, they have to meet on the beach. They have to. And now when you're saying – so can I just kind of dive in a little bit deeper into the heart chart because yeah. when you're saying you're tracking the emotional journey, what is exactly the heart chart doing to the character's emotional journey? Like how are you tracking this? Because it sounds fantastic, but physically, like well, technically, how is it working? Uh, I wonder – I don't know if I dare. I was going to try to call up, call up one and show you. Um, well, I mean, it's a, but but the, by answering the questions, mm-hmm. um, you get a series of pluses and minuses. This is good for the character. This is bad for the character. This progresses the character. This uh, is an obstacle that stops the character. This decision this character makes is going to have a consequence. Is that consequence good or bad? So you begin to measure ups Got and it. downs. Got it. Um, setbacks, uh, successes. I have I have a, a signpost I call the top of the mountain. Um, and, and I have another one called the Cinderella moment. I have another one called resurrection opportunity. These are terms that nobody's heard before. I have uh, veteran writers go, I've never heard of a resurrection opportunity. What a great, you know, and then where it goes and why top of the mountain. What I began to learn through fairy tales and really good narrative was that there's a top of the mountain dead center in your narrative. Where it's as good as you're going to get. You're, you, it's a, it's a success that you're, main characters have had or something they've accomplished where you're going, yes, they've done it. Now, is it, and, Chris where is Vogler, it? and Chris Vogler, his center is the ordeal. Right. You know, my ordeal is over here a little deeper in, but top of the mountain, um, is, uh, is, is become a term now and how you structure the first half of your story. But is the, top, the top of the mountain, but is the top of the mountain in the first act, second act, third act, no, where's middle where's, dead center, middle of the second act. Okay. Middle so is that it, dead, well, and even if you do five acts, it doesn't matter. It's the dead center of your narrative. And I begin to measure certain films and, and look at them and go, wow, I'm right. Uh, in, in the, the good, the first one, the good Indiana Jones, the primo Indiana. Oh, yeah, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Yeah. Literally one hour into that film, he's got the ark. He's in the truck. He's got the girl. He's on the boat. He's about to get a back rub. You know, and 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 boom, the movie's not over. Everything after that is a serious complication to whether or not he's going to make it or not, or whether he and Marion are going to survive or how they're going to get to the end of the movie. Yeah. You know? And I, and same thing in Dracula, I went back and looked at Francis's cut and I timed the rules cafe scene where he gives her the diamonds and the tears and they actually meet. And oh, so he beautiful. takes her back and connects with her one hour and four minutes into a two hour and, uh, and seven minute film. And that's as good as it gets for them. Everything else after that is complicated and everybody's trying to pull you down the mountain. Cinderella, which is where this started. Cinderella, she goes to the ball. You know, that, everybody that's... wants her phone number. You know, the prince goes, I'm not dancing with the sissy uglers anymore. I'm well, who are you? 
you know, she achieved her goal, which was in the real story was to get to the ball and plead to the prince for her father's estate to be given back to her. The Disney fied version and made it, you know, I want to get married to a handsome prince. Right. But that's the top of the mountain. That's dead center in the narrative. Then what happens? Oh, damn, she stays too long at the ball. Point of no return. Can't be undone. You know, consequences. Plan falls apart. You know, the end of the second act. She's back home to change the toilets again. You know, she's never going to get out. Resurrection opportunity. Oh, there's this glass slipper that she doesn't know about. The That's circulating right. town looking for her. Resurrection opportunity. It gives your it gives your character that second hope in, for the third act. And so, and I begin to measure really good filmmaking and really good film. Even Tarantino is heavily structured. Oh, see, that's totally the genius. Perfect. That's a, that's the genius of of Quentin is because he's his films look like they were thrown together. But yeah. even Pulp Fiction, you watch Pulp Fiction, perfect, that movie perfectly, is perfectly, perfectly, perfectly structured. No, it's so it's insane. It began to be. It began to give me the feeling that structure and character go together. They're not they're not competing with each other. They are they are complementing each other. And if you you learn this skill mechanically. It teaches you how to do this. I don't. The word "teach" is wrong. I don't like saying "teach." It gives you strategies on how you can accomplish this for your work. You know, and our chart also tells you how long it's been since you saw a character when they entered. Oh my God, I haven't had that character in thirty pages, or fifteen pages, or you know. So it begins to measure a pacing for you about when your exit stage left, uh, enter stage right. You know, when when a character shows up and what their what the impact is they have on the other characters. Sometimes your characters are going in completely opposite directions. But what Especially I love, Dracula. but what I love about your, but what you're with the hard chart, I love and and trust me, doing this show, I've interviewed everybody, I've talked to everybody about all their different types of structures. I'm always fascinated when I hear something new that gets me excited because at the end of the day, we're all trying to get to the same place. Yeah. We're we're all it's just different maps to the same place, and some people might like Vogler better or Truby better or Hart better. It, it, it's all relative. But what I love about what you're talking about is that you can see visually. The entire blueprint of your story. Blueprint's in a, a good word. Or a, a map. Yeah, a map or a blueprint of the whole thing. Because the, the the cards are one thing, but you can't physically. You got to go no, in and read it. Yeah, but visually to be able to see how the emotion of your characters and the emotion of your story is being charted, each one along yeah. the way, is fairly powerful. And when you see like there's a there's a dip. Oh wait a minute, there is. There's no, there's a problem yeah. here. They're yeah. flat. They're flatlining. Flatlining. Uh, you don't want to do. You know. Right. You're flatlining. Then you're dead. So that means there's something wrong over here, or I haven't seen this character for a while. Maybe we should bring this back in. That is is really fascinating. Can you tell me just um, the resurrection moment uh, or opportunity in Shawshank? I'm trying to think it in my head. I'm trying to oh, like where. Wow. Where is uh, that? Because he's lost oh, everything. Yes. Yes. It's when the resurrection opportunity is when he was when Morgan goes into. The um, goes into the, um, the 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 review that he goes through all the time, and he's been through all of this shit. And you know, they always turn him down. And this time, he goes and tells the truth. He finally stops lying, and he tells the truth to the committee. Oh, know, that's and that, said, but that's a resurrection for for Red. But how about for Andy? No. Or is there none oh. for Andy? I got to go back and remember the movie because because I I I agree with you. I think that the main character of the movie is Red. It's not yeah. Andy. It's Red. Yeah. Red's the storyteller. It's his point of view. Everything's coming from Red's point of view. But Andy, you don't see his resurrection moment because his resurrection moment is it kind of shown me, to us. Let me think about that because it could be because when Gil Bellows' when character gets killed, that's that's like disaster. It's yeah, all for, falling apart. So right. it's going to come after that. Whatever that resurrection opportunity is. For Andy's going to come after that, mm-hmm. um, and it may be it may be his that may be what prompts his brilliant escape. You know, his when he when he decides to I'm getting out. So in a way, what he's facing in prison after Bellows is killed, and he knows he knows that he's next. That uh, you know he, the poster is the poster is his fucking resurrection opportunity. When the po- well, no, when he when he clicks off and that first piece of plaster comes off, yeah, yeah. But that was years before yeah, Bellows. But, but he puts the poster up, right? Yeah. You know, um, uh, I don't remember when he did that, but the poster it comes after Gil's um, death. So whatever it is, it comes after Gil's death. 
okay. that gives him, where he gets the impetus, I'm getting out of here. Yeah, and I, I, it, it, it's all, it's so difficult to kind of narrow it down because Red is the main character, yeah, and Andy's so. and Andy's the back. But but we actually the, the the resurrection moment for Andy is actually revealed to us at the end when his entire yeah. story is kind yeah. of laid out. You're like, oh, that's when it happened. So it's Definitely not actually happened, so. shown to us. But Red, you're absolutely right, and it's yeah. tracked so beautifully when he just yeah, goes beautiful. in and just tells the truth. Oh, it's yeah. people of the people who listen to the show know my uh, affection for Shawshank Redemption <laughs> and Frank. And for, yeah. um, and Green Mile. I love Green Mile. Love, love Green Mile as well. Um, now, what is the biggest mistake you see screenwriters make? Because you work with a lot of first-time screenwriters. What is the one thing that you see like, oh, God, this is the one thing? Well, again, that's why I did the toolkit. Uh, they don't understand structure um, uh, at all. They think that – they think it's uh, it's really not your enemy. It's your It's your friend. And once you discover the structure doesn't make every single film the same, even though the signposts are uh, in my work are the, are the same, you can rearrange them. Can't change a point of no return. Can't change plan falls apart. Can't change resurrection opportunity. Can't change top of the mill. You know, if you have those four things, you can write back. You go back. I try to, I try to and satisfying ending. Mm-hmm. If you, if you have know what those are, you can write backwards. You know what your first act has to accomplish to set you on that journey. Um, the other thing, too, is I think that they're, they uh, overwrite dialogue and um, uh, they say they're not able to write behavior into their scripts. They say everything. On you know? the, so on the, known di- on the nose dialogue? Yeah. Our, our, our exposition all being, being verbal. So I miss behavior. And executives don't like to read behavior. They like to read dialogue with a lot of white on the page. So tell me what's going on. But good writers can write behavior into their character so that it's like for Indy, it's being afraid of snakes. You know, there's a phobia, you know, that that you know is going to show up again. You know that that snake's going to show up again. It's just when. So that structure is anticipation. Structure should make you anticipate, not go, okay, well, here comes the part where, you know, um, know, the monster's not really dead. Yeah, we know that. (laughs) Right. it's how it's delivered, and I get the my, my favorite example is I always tell I worked I watched I worked with Robin Williams uh, who was a, he and his family were great friends and um, we it's uh, oh I can imagine out here, but I watched Robin the best structuralist I ever saw at work was Robin Williams. Interesting. Everybody just thinks that all this stuff came out of his mind. He just pulled it in from everywhere, you know, and all that. And yeah, he did have a great database, but I watched him film live his uh, stand-up show for HBO three nights in a row. And at the end of, in, at the end of each night, he would take the card out of his back pocket and he'd start making notes and scratch things out and move, you know? Uh, and he would, he would talk to you. Maybe, maybe you had dinner before or something. He would pick in your brain on something and he would show up in the show. But I watched him rearrange his, um, his cards every night, you know, to find, to try to find that smooth ride that he wanted where, where one thing led to another, but it seemed like it came out of nowhere. You know, and for those that don't believe me, if you've ever seen the history of golf by mm-hmm. Robin Williams, I've, oh, that was an amazing! I love that. No matter how many times you watch it, how many times you see him do it, same fucking punchline every time. Yeah, and you're laughing at all the same places oh. if you've heard it for the first time. That's yes. structure. You know, and all your friends that do improv and bedazzle you with, oh, how do you do that? It's structure. They have a set of circumstances and a set of givens and a set of signposts and a set of circumstances that they always resort to to then invent inside that box. And yeah. and that's the interesting because I know exactly the bit you're talking about because I pissed myself every single time I saw him play do that and I and it was so and I you know what thinking back when I when I heard him doing that bit which is a like why did the Scottish create golf yeah. and and how yeah. and then the story of the dude that actually creates it and yeah. how he builds stages sections and it's plotting and I never thought about that in joke writing because I'm not a joke writer or stand up. Yeah. But he actually structured that so beautifully because when you think he's done, he's like, no, wait a minute. We're going to do this, this, this. 18 times. And then yeah. we're going to do it. And then we, they, oh, yeah, we'll throw it sand in and we'll do this. And then, we'll, hey, let's do it 18 times. You're just like, oh, my God, this is amazing. Yeah. We're going to throw this little ball a thousand and you're going to feel like it's a str- – <laughs> we'll call it a stroke. That's right because every time you miss, you feel like you're yeah, going to have a cool. heart attack. <laughs> yeah. you, can't, you, can't, you can't argue – that he makes that up as he goes along, but it feels like it. That, that was his That's brilliance. Structure. 
that was his and brilliance. also anybody you know it's what they say about a comedian he has good timing or she has good timing or she really knows how to land a line or really that's structure interesting interesting so that yeah it was it was uh, I, and i and i had a short interaction with robin uh about three months before he passed and i he was such a gentle soul and i yeah. just yeah I, I don't know because you were really good friends with him there was something I felt off when I met him. I felt this kinetic thing that was coming off of him, even though he was quiet and calm that day. But you could feel that, that there was this energy. I don't know. Maybe it's just me, but he was just like this this energy that just kept going. I'm like, oh, my God, that must be insane to deal with because he was – that thing that you saw on stage. But well, he yeah, to- he's actually, he's actually, yeah, he's actually very shy. Right. And, he, he was very calm. Uh, and very quiet. quiet and reserved and – but but if you threw the match in the haystack, you know <laughs> he felt that obligation to he felt that obligation to perform and entertain and make everybody feel good. But he, I mean, when we did dinner with his kids, I mean the, the kids dominate the conversation, and Robin would just sit and listen. But he he was very attentive that way, and um, and it was the side of him that you don't expect to see. Um, and also, just he had a he had a lot of things going on in, in his, his life. In, himself anyway um i'll do a robin story it's, it's sure please again it's it's it I, I my wife and i were there with them it happened you know what it didn't ever show up in any routine but uh and marcia is his his the good his incredible wife with the kids um we're still very close we were at we went to san francisco and i introduced him to albert dupontel a very famous french comedian who he loved and we all went to dinner at one of their cool restaurants in San Francisco, big high ceilings, and and uh, we have a long table, you know, and everybody's looking at Robin, you know, and and uh, and on, on the wall there's a, a group that are from Texas, or and I can say this because I'm from Texas, and and one of them had big hair, you know, and they're loud and having a good time, and all of a sudden we I, I, I see and Robin would you know he would do this a lot, you know, and I watched him looking up. And he was starting to get kind of nervous and like, oh. he kept looking up and it was the, above this woman who's sitting across from us. He kept looking up at the ceiling and we were all, and he's going, and we all sort of started sneaking peeks and, and there's this giant roach <laughs> climbing the wall in this you know, super hell dim, ritzy high end San Francisco room. This giant roach, the fucking roach is that big <laughs> and it's climbing up the wall to mm-hmm. the ceiling. Mm-hmm. Directly above this woman's head, <gasps> and Robin's just going, "Oh God, no, no!" <laughs> yeah, and we're all going, "Oh my God, is it going to fall?" Is it and, gonna she fall? Can, and she starts looking at, like, looking at the table, like we're all like, oh. and he didn't want to call the manager over. Hey, there's a fucking roach, and finally it happened. She falls <gasps> no. right top of her hair. No. Robin falls out. He cannot control his laughter any longer. He is on the floor. He is guffawing. You know, he is sitting where the whole place is lit up. And she's like, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. And he's like, I'm so And he's trying to I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to laugh at you. And she stands up and announces to the whole restaurant. She points right at, right at Robin and says, Robin Williams, you're not funny. <laughs> and, of course, then the whole. <laughs> yeah. And uh, he bought the dinner and everything else, but uh, it was so it was it, it, you couldn't. And it was like a sketch out a sketch a sketch out of uh, Saturday Night Live, Harold Lloyd Comedy. No, it sounded like an old, oh, like okay. a Charlie Chaplin, you know, bit bit, you know. And we're all we watched it play out in real time, and it was hysterical. And also, oh. because she, they left the restaurant, but he bought dinner, and the manager came out and complained. They had a big fucking roach in her hair. <laughs> <laughs> they had to get it out, you know, and step on it. Oh my God, that must have been amazing. He got on his knees. He got on his knees. I'm so sorry. You know, you're not funny. <laughs> course, which, of course, that's my which of course everybody knows he is and yeah. was quite funny. He, when she when she said that to him, he started laughing again because he's just like, oh, this is brilliant. This is I can't write this. You can't write that. You can't write you that can't. story. <laughs> and, and to have sat there and witnessed it, it was even it was like we're. Kind of, I can't believe you. Like, it's going to fall. It's going to land right on her head. We're just waiting. You yeah. know the and, and it's 
I could just as you're telling the story, my director mind is like shot here, shot oh, on the yeah. roach, shot yeah. on the close up eyes. Like you could just you're just like it's a Hitchcock scene all yeah. of a sudden. <laughs> it is a, it is very Hitchcock, you know. And <laughs> and and of course what what we all assess was a roach went up there to commit suicide. It had it. <laughs> and then that was dive a- into dive into a bowl of, of, of spray net, you know, and, and suffocate. <laughs> roach, I'm done with this world. I'm we're uh, out of here. I'm I can't t- th- we're gone. And if I'm gonna do it's this. Over. I'm going to do this right. Let's go all the way to this. <laughs> What's the matter? Did you get tired? You couldn't hold on? You know, would you, would you give up? Oh, no. I'm yeah. sure Robin kept going. I'm sure he kept building but up a actually, backstory. Actually, top of the mountain. <laughs> and, then, and then point of no return and disaster. That's amazing. Resurrection That's... opportunity. You're not funny. <laughs> Change the rubber. Anyway. Um that's a, that, and now, now I can work that into a structure lesson. Okay. Yeah, oh, absolutely. You should absolutely work that into a structure lesson. No question. I haven't told uh, that story in a long time. Sorry if I digress. No, no, no. I think it, it's we. It's an amazing story, and it actually works about structure. You actually turned it into a structure uh, lesson as well. Um, now I wanted to ask you. Uh, well, first of all, I mean, you've written all these amazing movies and and worked with amazing people, but I mean, obviously, the top of your mountain was writing for the Muppets. Obviously. They were my favorite experience. <laughs> they, oh, I, I, did, I just I did, Brian Henson and I just exchanged uh, notes recently on his birthday. Yeah, um, that was the that was the I guess that's the cast pajamas or the bee's knees or the, you know the yeah the, like I'm, the nuts, I'm not, nuts. I mean, you're um, working with the was, Muppets. It was it's totally amazing. unexpected. Um, Brian, Brian and I had met during Hook and. Uh, uh, and, and another book that we wanted to do, the Paul Gallico is a man of his magic, which is a Gallico novel I'm adapting now. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, and they, he, we'd met and liked each other. And, and he came to me, Disney was going to pull the plug on Muppet Treasure Island. Mm-hmm. They didn't like where it was going. Um, and they came to me and, and Brian said, well, you read the script. We're about to, we're about to lose this project, you know? And, we're having problems. Can you just read it and give me some feedback? And I read it, and there was no human beings in the script. There was no Jim Hawkins. There was no Lon John. So oh. they were all Muppets. But by, by the way, for people who are not catching up, um, you wrote Treasure Island, uh, Muppet Treasure Island. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. so, yeah. yeah, people might not know. Well, what, what, I, I mean, I, I came in and put my oar in the water with great people like Jerry Jewell and you sure, know, sure, from, sure. Uh, uh, Bill Bottolotta and stuff like that. But. Um, uh, and I read it and said, there's no humans. You can't make this movie with no humans. You can't right. have Jim Hawkins be a puppet and, and, and Robert and, uh, Long John Silver be a puppet. You can't do it. You know, um, it's like Lucas, when he first did Star Wars, they were all robots, you know, and you, you, you gotta have the, the human being element, you know, uh, did, is that so, true? Wait a minute. Is oh, that true? Is, when Star Wars, when he wrote, first wrote it, everybody it was, was CPO, it was CPO and R2D2. They were the heroes. Okay. Right. And then Luke yeah. showed up yeah. afterwards. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. So um, we 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 would shed it up at my house and um, uh, up in the Hudson River, which and and actually Brian's brother lived nearby. We snowstorms and piles of snow, so we spent three days working on the script. And and the reason there were no humans in the script is that Frank Oz did not like to work with children. He's got twelve of his own, but he doesn't like to work. And so I said, well, let me write some scenes and see if we can convince Frank. Different, differently. Um, so um, we wrote some scenes, and um, they were they loved the scenes because I, I brought some some humanity back into the story, especially the relationship between Jim and London Silver was been a seminal relationship in my my upbringing about villains. I mean, I have a whole thing on villains, why they're the good guys, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and so it was you were able, we were able to do that emotional connection between Jim and Long John. Keep all the jokes in, keep all the stuff in, you know. But the funny part was casting the Muppets in their various roles because they are like movie stars. Yeah. I mean, I would suggest I would now I would suggest uh, uh, we they were having a hard time casting Kermit. So I would suggest that, and Brian would say, "Nah, Kermit won't play that role. He's not. He won't be good in that kind of part." Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, what do we do with Miss Piggy? You know. Um, but you know, she had to have just the right role, or she wouldn't do the film. She wanted a big, <laughs> wanted a bigger trailer or something. So you begin to understand that this that this this world of Muppets is like an archaeological dig. They have a history the way movie stars have a history. Yeah. Oh, it's absolutely. Incredible. And and the people that created the character are the only ones who could do them. There was a big controversy when Jim died 
if they were going to continue Kermit. Oh, wow. So, and that's what's interesting. I mean, when Frank Oz's hand goes up Miss Piggy's skirt, he's Miss Piggy. Nobody else is Miss Piggy but Frank Oz, you know. Um, and um, so that was interesting to see that, that the, the I mean, Gonzo and Rizzo, you know, I can't remember the performer's name, but they were created by the puppeteer, by the Muppeteer. Mm-hmm. So as long as they were alive, they did the characters. You know, then you had other Muppeteers who came in and did ancillary characters. But casting Kermit and casting Miss Piggy was the most difficult part of the of the show. Wow. You know, uh, and uh, uh, we miss, we made Miss Piggy Benjamina Gunn, who had been marooned on the island and had a string of pirate lovers, including Long John Silver. <laughs> uh, and and actually, uh, it was fun to watch Frank work on set because he, he would stay in character even between takes. Did he? Re- Are you serious? Yeah. I have a better line than that. That's a terrible line. Hey, Brian, let's shoot it again. You know, <laughs> who wrote this shit? And and so and Brian and, and Miss Piggy would have a dialogue, you know, between takes uh, uh, with Frank as Miss Piggy. Same thing, same, same thing with Steve. Same thing with Steve Whitmire, who did um, Kermit. They, they would normally stay in character between takes unless they took a break and. Right. Shed the, you know, shed the, uh, shed the, uh, and then when my kids were with me on the set, um, in London and, um, uh, we had, and you're, they're alive. I mean, they don't have eyes that don't, their eyes, eyes don't move. They don't have, you know, they're not marionettes. Right. No. You know, um, they don't, you know, and we're leaving the set and we let actually the set are saying goodbye to Brian end of the day and there's a whole trolley full of all the Muppets hanging impaled on their on their spikes, you know? <gasps> oh my God. And Julia, who just direct, who just directed her fourth film, she was I think ten then, when she freaked out and said, Oh my God, they're dead. You know, I don't want to see this. I mean their eyes suddenly their eyes no, of course. were like, uh no, of right. so it was and, and getting to work with Jerry Jewell and the whole Muppet Henson team was extraordinary. Wow, it must have been so you know, much fun such, working with them. Such a culture, such a such a culture of um, of, of 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 caring and talk about character. You know, I mean, those characters don't change. They're like movie stars. No, they absolutely. Always play themselves. My 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 yeah. Kermit the Frog I grew up with, which was Jim, and the Kermit the yeah. Frog that lives today, uh, the character is the same. His all his principles are the same. His Piggies is the same. Gonzo's is the same. Yeah, Fozzie's is the same. It's it, they are they're movie stars, but they yeah. it's they're 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 actually uh, it, it's fascinating. I just wanted to touch really quickly. You said something very interesting. You believe villains are heroes. Yep. Can you touch on that? Because that's fascinating. I'd love to hear your take on that real quick. Yeah. Well, villains are how I made my career, um, and it all started with, as a kid when I again, uh, why is why is Long John Silver the bad guy? Mm-hmm. Why is why is Captain Nemo the bad guy? You know, I started as a kid. I'm going, wait a minute. Captain Nemo wants to end slavery. He wants to abolish weapons of mass destruction. He wants to end war. You know, I'm voting for president. You know, he's my guy. And 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 any 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 advanced nuclear energy. So so far, I'm getting people's going good, good, good nuclear energy. Well, no, I don't know. And then he destroyed nuclear energy because he knew what we do with it. We got our hands on it. Mm-hmm. I cried when when um, when James Mason goes down. With the Nautilus, I wanted to kill Ned Land and Kirk Douglas for throwing the bottles and having him blow up his stuff. I couldn't figure out why he was the bad guy. Right. Same thing with Lon John Silver. Lon John Silver taught so taught Jim Hawkins so much about being a man and being loyal and being a mate. And, you know, when Jim had a chance to kill, to shoot Lon John at the end when he's stealing the treasure, he let him go. He learned so much from Lon John. Um, uh, same thing with uh, with uh, with Dracula. When I finally started researching Dracula, Dracula was a fallen angel. He wasn't a guy in a tuxedo that just wants to suck your throat. There was a story. So villains to me are the – villains advance history. Villains force society to change. You know, they, they, they force us to advance and, and to achieve new – and also they're visionaries. We may not always agree. Every one of, of um, Jules Verne's um, uh, The Man Who Conquered the World, you know, all, the, all these guys were visionaries. Right. Uh, John, John Galt in, uh, in um, Atlas Shrugged. The visionary didn't agree with his politics, but he was a visionary. You know, so the villain started coming jumping out to me like, wait a minute, why, why, am, why is the villain so misunderstood and so you know? And then suddenly we now have all, and these are all 
villains from literature, mm-hmm. you know, uh, for me. Um, uh, Jekyll and Hyde um, uh, is a big one for me. The, what, yeah. what, uh, what Robert Louis Stevenson intended. His wife burned his first manuscript. That's the one I wanted to read. Yeah. Really? Uh, yeah, she burned it. If Why? Was, was just, she, I'm sure it revealed too much about them, you know. Because uh, oh, wow. he he led a he led a double life in real in real life. He led a double life with his mates. He would take them to London, give them nicknames, give them identities. They'd whore and winch around. Then he'd come back up to his little Calvinist, you know. So suddenly, the villain was more interesting to me than the hero. Um, <clears throat> uh, the least interesting character in Star Wars is Luke, till he finds out who his father is. Then <laughs> suddenly, he's interesting. You're, you're absolutely right. <laughs> um, uh, you know, Harry Potter is another kid who's going to learn bad magic for bar mitzvahs until he finds out who his father is. Right. Yeah. Um, so it's, it, the villain is also what makes you special. And, and I think Bogler and I both agree on this. It's what, it's what, it's what forces the call to action, what forces a hero to emerge to the villain. So the, the, hero, the, the hero is really indebted to the villain. And I don't, I don't call them villains anymore as much as a nemesis. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Right, a, the villain to me sound like a card, cardboard thing in a video game, or a you know twir- mustache twirling. And uh, and that's what, and that's one of the things about villains that I mean, without a good villain, the, the story doesn't go forward. Like no. you could have the, you could have Hercules, but without you know all of the the like well, perfect example in today's age Marvel movies. I mean, Thanos was an amazing villain, and that they built it up over a decade of films and how yeah. they built that up to the point where at Endgame, when everybody, literally the entire universe, Marvel universe has to, has to come to fight him yeah. all at the same. That's why that's such a cathartic yeah. moment. Yeah. But that without Thanos, yeah. it's just, or if he's a weakling or he's not as, you know, it's, it, and it's a balance too, because when you have a, when you have a, a villain that's so powerful that there's no hope that he could ever be beaten. Then it's like, why are we watching this? Yeah, and that's there's why Darth, that's why Darth Vader. When you get Darth Vader's backstory, and that's why George did a brilliant job in, in Jedi um, of actually getting to see Anakin um, as that gentle old older man who who you can see as being Luke's father, you know. Right. Um, and even Anakin. I mean, I, I would do this. I, I ask this to my students: Why is why is Darth Vader bad? What did he do that was so terrible? Well, then you go back to the lore, and he went to the dark side to save his wife. You know, right. he chose, he chose the dark side to save his wife's life. That's love. So that also gives you some redemptive quality. The end of this worth the script I'm writing right now, another Gallico novel, the love of seven dolls has a horrible, terrible nemesis in it. And, and slowly be being to reveal what, it, why he's like this and why he can't stand there to be anything pure and uncorrupt. He has to corrupt everything. And there's a reason why. And when you find out that reason why, when you find out what that villain's Achilles heel is, it's not just a way to kill them. It's a way to understand them and, uh, and, and empathize with them. Well, like in perfect example, Thanos, he, he just wants to, yeah. you know, he, it's overpopulation. It's too much yeah. overpopulation yeah. in the world. My solution which is he's to, not wrong. Which he's is not wrong. He's not wrong. <laughs> How he approaches it is wrong. And that's where the villainous aspect is to these characters. Yeah. But it's not like the olden twisting the mustache to be yeah. bad just for be bad. There's no depth there. And that's what yeah. – Drives a good story. I mean, yeah. James, I could keep talking to you for at least two, three more hours, but I'm just going to ask you. A few, I'm going to ask you a few questions. I ask all my guests, and and uh, and then I will la- I leave you on to write more more things. It's all, all the answers are in here. <laughs> okay. www.heartchart.com. US ISA twenty is your discount code. Um. So, uh, what three three what three screenplay should every screenwriter read? Wow, uh, Shawshank. Mm-hmm. Oh man, after my own heart. <laughs> um, probably uh, uh, Godfather One. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Great. Um, and not just a transcript of the movie, but you get you know no. get the get no. the published the published screenplay. Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, probably Bonnie and Clyde. Yeah, another great one. Um. um it's I mean again the, the characters, not the plot, the characters. Yeah. Um, and I would I mean I'm I'm proud of some of the stuff I've written, but um, um, if I someone read, if I actually read um, 
actually, well, I actually have George Lucas's first American graffiti script. We were supposed to try, try to finance it for him. Godfather one, Shawshank. Um, I would read some TV episodes too. I'd read some, I'd read some of, of, of Vince's um, episodes of Breaking Bad to see, to show you what you can do in 45 to 50 pages. The pilot uh, is, is a genius yeah. work. Yeah. Um, um, if someone was going to read a, one, a, if someone's going to read one of your screenplays, if you're like, you can only read one of my scripts, which one is it? I'd, I'd read Dracula. Yeah. Yeah. I would agree with you. Yeah. yeah. I love yeah. Dracula. Yeah. I, I, I don't know how, how it exists in some form or not because it, we, we did all that extra work. Also the, the August rush script I'm real proud of. Uh, mm-hmm. August rush is the last time I worked with Robin. And, um, um, I thought, um, Kirsten did such a good job directing directing that film, and uh, didn't get the it didn't get the acknowledgement that it should have because I should have put Once Upon a Time. It's a really good, it's 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 a screenplay where I used everything I know about the heart chart, everything I know about character, everything I know about structure is in that film. Uh, and to me, there's a talk about a satisfying ending. Some people are not satisfied because they don't see them together, mm-hmm. but for me, it's incredibly satisfying oh, because he it. he he accomplished his goal. He brought his parents together. Yeah. And I can watch it a hundred times and it still gets me every time I get to that part. Now what can't help it. Now what advice would you give a screenwriter trying to break into the business today? Well, the business has completely changed. I mean it's wide open for, for writers the way it wasn't for me when I started out. Uh, Blacklist, uh, Inc Inc uh, Inkwell, uh, uh, Austin Film Festival uh, screenplay <laughs> contests, uh, all of the fellowships that are being offered through Nichols and through Warner Brothers and Disney and um, uh, I the International Screenwriters Association I think are wonderful. I say, yep. Um, they've done a lot of I've done a lot of work for them. Screencraft, um, Stage Thirty Two. These are all platforms that didn't exist when we were trying to start out. There was no helping hand. Um, the Austin Film Festival is worth uh, submitting to keep submitting. You know, you, your and your scripts are now being read. They're not just going into the, a black hole. They're actually being read. You know, you've got 200 readers on the on the on the blacklist that are there to find scripts. That's their job, for their for their their producers, their studios, their networks. They're there looking. That's how my daughter got her first film made was through the blacklist. You know, she just directed her fourth film at Amazon. I'm I'm your woman is Julia Hart. You know, um, Star Girl is Julia Hart. Um, um, and the and the every and the, plus the business is looking for the new uh, threshold writers. Uh, uh, they've, they've had it with me, you know. We, they don't want to put up with us anymore. They want the new, fresh voices um, uh, who are coming out of uh, not necessarily film schools, but coming out of workshops and master classes. And mm-hmm. we didn't have that access. You've also got a hundred more buyers than we had. Oh, thousand yeah. probably. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And and it'll change. The COVID the COVID thing will come and go. Not not that it's going to go, but we'll we'll find a way to live with it. Um, and we're already trying to get into production. As soon as production starts and some of that development moves off the shelf, they're looking. Okay. And I, I think it's a great time to be a writer, uh, especially in TV, where finally that, that it is true. The writer has the power in television. You know, uh, they used to say that, and then, uh, but now it's true. Now, yeah. what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? Uh, to listen. Okay. You know, that's what I learned that from Francis and a few other people to, to never be, never speak first in the meeting and, uh, and listen and listen to everything they have to say and nod your head a lot and go, that's a good idea. Well, think about that. Make notes and then go back. And, uh, Francis just said, whatever, even if you disagree with everything they said, you know, you go back and you take, you look at your notes and the ones that keep haunting you, the ones that keep coming back and biting you in the ass. Those are the ones you have to address. Yeah. But I think listening is the uh, – listen and collaborate. And where can uh, – where can, if, you don't want to, if you don't want to collaborate, go sculpt or you know, uh, <laughs> right. go do a painting. You know, we're in a, if, you, if you're not able to collaborate, you're going to have a hard time. And where can people find more about uh, the Heart Chart and, and everything you do? Heartchart, heart, heartchart.com is the website. You'll find on there we – just put up our four master classes that we filmed in Austin last year that are available for a special bundle. The toolkit is there for a download, which I'm going to send you one good, sir. Thank you. Uh, sorry. I look forward to that. Uh, and the chart is a monthly subscription. Uh, you can get in and out anytime you want to. It's eight, eight ninety nine a month. 
but I recommend that everybody sort of spend time with the toolkit before they try the heart chart. Uh, it's a great tool. I've just had, uh, just in this last week, we had like another 30 or 40 subscriptions based on the last master class that I did. Um, and we're updating the, we're updating the, the, um, the story mapping tool all the time. You get a two week free trial. You can go in and play with the examples and see what the other films that we have there. Um, like us on Facebook, like us on Twitter. Uh, and I will be doing some more classes, uh, in, um, some online classes, uh, in, in 2021. Sounds good. Yeah. Ja- James, thank you so much for taking the time out to, to share your story, oh, share your information me. Uh, and, and talking, uh, talking to our tribe. So I truly appreciate it. And thank you for all the good work you've done through your career well, and, and continuing. Now, now, now you've got to do what you told me you're going to do. You, now you know about the heart chart. So. Oh, yeah. I'll be talking about and, it. Don't worry about I'll it. Send you your thing. Now, this is a great – and I think what you guys are doing are great. The podcast is a, is a whole other network that we never had access to. So I, I appreciate the exposure. Last thing. Just remember when you're down and out on yourself that nobody, no director, no writer, no, no actor, no producer, no costume designer, no DP, nobody has a job in this business until a writer types the end. So hey. that's the best advice I can give you is go type the end. Thank you, James. I want to thank James so much for coming on the show and dropping those knowledge bombs on the Bulletproof Screenwriting Tribe. James, thank you so much. You are an inspiration. And if you guys want to take a closer look at the heart chart and everything that James has to offer, please head over to the show notes at bulletproofscreenwriting.tv forward slash 094. And don't forget, guys, to take advantage of this Black Friday sale. These prices will not be down this low again for a long, long time. So definitely take advantage. Up to 50 to 70% off the amazing courses at IFH Academy. So head over to bulletproofscreenwriting.tv forward slash Black Friday. Thank you guys so much. As always, keep on writing no matter what. Stay safe out there, and I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast at bulletproofscreenwriting.tv. 